Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Shabakaz Policy Labs. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Nadim Balasa. I'm the commissioning editor at Shabaka. I'm sure that, like myself, many of you have been glued to your screens, watching and reading with horror, and maybe even with some hope and pride, uh, what's been happening in Palestine over the last few weeks and to this very moment. And in these overwhelming times, I very much appreciate your attendance tonight and your willingness to engage uh, with our speakers in this critical topic, the ongoing Nakba. I'm honored to be your facilitator this evening. The dramatic events taking place in Jerusalem, Gaza, and across historic Palestine over the last few weeks have been unfolding as the Nakba entered its 74th year on May 15. But for Palestinians, the ongoing dispossession and oppression they endure today signify a continuation of decades of settler colonial violence uh, inflicted by the Israeli regime. How do the recent assaults on Palestinians in Gaza, Sheikh Jarrah, the Al-Aqsa complex, Haifa, Akka, Lid, and other cities and towns across historic Palestine reflect the structural realities of Israel's military occupation, dispossession, and destruction of Palestinians' lives and lands? Do the unprecedented reactions of Palestinians across historic Palestine represent a change in the narrative of Palestinian resistance? How can the frameworks of settler colonialism and apartheid be employed strategically to dismantle the policies and structures that drive the Israeli state's violence? Is international law obsolete? Joining us today to answer these questions and more are our, our esteemed guests, Asil al and Saleh Hijazi. Asil al is a legal researcher and advocacy officer at al Haq, the Palestinian human rights organization in Ramallah. Asil was awarded the Ireland Palestine Scholarship to study at the Irish Center for Human Rights at the National University of Ireland in Galway, where she completed her LLM in international human rights law. In addition to her academic research, which focuses on the transitional, uh, transitional justice and decolonization in Palestine, she writes opinion pieces and articles in several media outlets, including the Electronic Intifada, Al Jazeera, and the New Arab. And Shabaka policy analyst Saleh Hijazi is a human rights act activist and researcher based in Jerusalem and Ramallah. He's the regional deputy director of Amnesty Middle East and North Africa in Jerusalem. He has served as advisor to the Al Quds University Human Rights Clinic, where he worked as academic coordinator and lecturer. Saleh holds a master's degree in human rights from the University of Essex and a bachelor's degree in philosophy and political science from Lawrence University. Thank you both very much for joining us this evening. I'm sure you're both very overwhelmed uh, with, with, with work and uh, uh, with being in Palestine. Um, just to inform our, our audience members, the format of tonight's policy lab will be as follows. For the first 30 minutes, uh, I'll pose some questions to Asil and Saleh. During the second half of the lab, our speakers will answer questions from you. So throughout the discussion, at any moment, please submit your questions uh, by clicking on the Ask a Question button at the bottom. And remember that you can vote on the questions you'd like asked. Uh, I will do my best to address as many of the questions as I can in the time we have together. So let's begin. Asil, I'd like to, to start with you. Um, you've been working tirelessly to report on and analyze the situation in Sheikh Jarrah, in Gaza, and across historic Palestine over the last few weeks. Can you describe to us the situation as you see it, uh, how it unfolded and how it's currently uh, progressing? Uh, can you tell us your thoughts about the, what this all signifies in the greater scheme of Palestinians' history and present? Uh, thank you, Nadim. Thank you, for Shabaka, for hosting us. Uh, and for the topic uh, we are talking about, which is very crucially important and is being also uh, talked about, not only in Palestine, but is being spread across the globe uh which is very which is the hope you talked about and i would like to start uh, honestly from sheikh jarrah because i see it as a microscope and also the spark of what's been going on and what has been going on in palestine uh, since 1948 and specifically with the story of uh, we've all seen i think the viral video of munal kurd uh, she's one of the residents of sheikh jarrah uh, who is at risk of forced displacement. 
She's one of the 500 Palestinians Sheikh Jarrah at first, uh, risk of forcible displacement. And she's one of the leaders as well of the uh, campaign to save Sheikh Jarrah. And we've seen her confronting a settler. Uh, his name is Yaqub in this video, where she's asking him, uh, Yaqub, uh, she's asking him, uh, this is not your home. And he replies uh, saying that, uh, yes, it's not my home, but if it's not me stealing your home, it's someone else. Uh, and he also says that uh, I can't even give this home that I stole to you because it's not mine. So this story, I think, uh, represents something that we're uh, some of the international audience might miss because we've seen some media discourse portraying the issue in Sheikh Jarrah as a real dispute issue or focusing too much on the settler organization that is need leading against uh, residents of Sheikh Jarrah. But when we see the discourse of this settler, Yaqub, coming from the U.S. with his accent, say it, saying to Muna that if it's not me, it's someone else, we understand that this settler understand that he is backed up by state policies, by state institutions, by state, the judiciary even, and the, 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 the army and the police. They all collude together to enforce the same goal, which is the settler colonial uh, settler colonialism in Palestine and replacing the Palestinian indigenous population with a uh, with a settler uh, presence in Palestine. So this is how the story of Sheikh Jarrah exemplifies the the overall context of of Palestine because forcible displacement is happening in Sheikh Jarrah. It's happening in Silwan. It's happening in Jerusalem as a whole. It's happening. Uh, in the West Bank, it's happening also alongside, uh, inside the Green Line, in the Naqab, in in, uh, in Jaffa. So we need to understand that Sheikh Jarrah is just an example or a manifestation of the ongoing uh, uh, forcible displacement uh, in Palestine, which takes various forms, all facilitated and designed by Israel's uh, discriminatory laws and policies, which constitute its apartheid regime and settler colonial foundation. Uh, now we've also seen how this solidarity with the campaign to save Sheikh Jarrah have drawn attention from uh, starting, first of all, from Jerusalemite, supporting uh, the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, but moving on, people, uh, Palestinians began to, uh, came from across uh, the Galilee, from across uh, inside the Green Line, to support their brothers and sisters in, in, in Sheikh Jarrah. And how these protests were met with suppression by the Israeli occupying forces, uh, where we've seen Palestinians sitting uh, next to their homes, breaking their fast during the month of Ramadan, and uh, standing in solidarity with each other to uh, stop these forced eviction, and how the Israeli police suppressed them using uh, a brutal force and skunk water, and mounting horses to disperse the protesters, and detaining the protester, beating them, uh, using fire, uh, tear gas, canisters, and all these brutal tools uh, to weaken uh, the will of the Palestinian people and to protest the, the, the displacement that is now for the people of Sheikh Jarrah, their second displacement. Uh, and the inspiring thing about these protests in Sheikh Jarrah is that uh, we've seen how the youth is leading these protests and we, we as youth, the Palestinian youth, are fed up because, first of all, we, 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 we have been dealing with this since we were born. We've been hearing the stories of our grandparents telling us about the Nakba, but as soon as we were, ch we were children, even it's not in our adult life, we realized that this is also our reality, the dispossession and the displacement and the suppression of our resistance. So we are fed up because we also don't have a political leadership present, representing us in the way we see our future. And we, we want Palestine to be liberated and to be decolonized. We don't want a state without even the Palestinian people our, uh, as a whole. We want the Palestinian refugees to return to their homes. We want our right to self-determination to be recognized. So all these demands that the Palestinian people were uh, standing in solidarity with Sheikh Jarrah, it's to stop the forced displacement of these 500 people in Sheikh Jarrah, but it's to fulfill all these other demands that as Palestinian people and as Palestinian youth are now rising and saying in one voice across all historic Palestine, we are fed up, we want our the root causes of our oppression to be remedied and to be ended. 
Uh, and we've also seen how the violence has spread to, to, to Gaza, uh, which is unfortunate. I don't want to speak about numbers about Palestinians in, in Gaza being killed or the homes being uh, being demolished because we, we often tend to talk about Gaza, specifically people in Gaza as during the, the various military offensive uh, from, the, from Israel, uh, we tend to talk about uh, the people in Gaza and the homes being demolished as numbers. And this is also part of the dehumanization that the Palestinian people are enduring since 1948. We, we tend to forget that these people uh, being killed have uh, mourning families behind them, that the people now on in, uh, in Gaza, that their, their houses have been bombed by, by Israel, are not homeless. They are internally displaced. And this is also not the first time that they are left on the streets because 70% of the people in the Gaza Strip are refugees. We need also to remember that uh, they, they have been denied their right to return since 48 and in 19. Uh, sorry, in 2018, they, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians um, launched the Great uh, March of Return, calling for the right of return and also the end of the blockade in Gaza. So we need now to understand that all these violence happening in Palestine and also uh, against Palestinian citizens of Israel or Palestinians uh, inside uh, the Green Line, uh, with settler violence, uh, chanting death to Arabs and marking Palestinian homes as if they are uh, eligible for for death just because they're Palestinians, with the support of the Palis uh, of the Israeli police. Uh, apologies, of the Israeli police, uh, which encourages this uh, continuing and ongoing violence since 1948 till this day. So uh, just to conclude this as a whole, uh, in one sentence, I would like to say that it is, uh, it is very depressing to see that we are losing Palestinian lives and we are losing our homes and we are still being denied our right to return. And we are still being uh, at the risk of displacement because this is a settler colonial project that aims at uh, displacing us uh, at, at, uh, till the end, uh, till the moment when Palestine is uh, is free from Palestinian indigenous people. But at the same moment, the the hope in this and what's going on is that we, as the Palestinian people, despite all these years of fragmentation, seventy three years of fragmentation, we're now coming in one voice with one goal, which is to. Unfortunately, it seems we've uh, lost contact with Asil briefly. Asil, are you are you with us again? Asil, so we will. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> So while Asil reconnects and joins us, we'll ask her to uh, complete her thought. Um, but uh, I think what, what Asil managed to, to convey to us is, is a very obviously sobering reality of, an on, of really what we're talking about when we say the ongoing Nakba and, and how in many ways very little has changed in terms of the, the narratives of dispossession, the, the, the sort of the quality of of, of of the occupation of the violence, the kind of violence we're seeing, this is this is something that you know Palestinians have been experiencing for for seventy three years, but uh, also pointing to us, uh, pointing out to us that there there is something different happening, and there is uh, a, a reason to be hopeful. Perhaps um, this takes us to our next question, actually, for Saleh. Saleh, um, <clears throat> you've been following the, the developments across historic Palestine, more specifically from Tarshiha in the north and Haifa and Akka to Ramallah and Jerusalem and Lid. Uh, what what we've been seeing is is unprecedented, certainly in in, in the history of Palestinian resistance. Can you describe to us uh, or, or, or provide us with some some of your perspective on what we're seeing uh, in terms of Palestinians' reactions to the Israeli regime's violence over the last? 
few weeks. Uh, how does it fit into our history of, of being victims, but of also being uh, resistors? Uh, why is this significant now? And uh, just to welcome back Asil, sorry about that, uh, that internet glitch, but um, uh, and when we go back to you, we'll ask uh, perhaps for you to, to give us the final comments from, from, from your last uh, response. Thanks, Nadim, and um, uh, warm hellos to everyone here. Uh, let me basically just set a bit of context to answer the question, uh, Nadim. Um, and as Asil was describing, um, um, and also Sheikh Jarrah being uh, that microcosm of the Palestinian experience. Uh, our experience as Palestinians has been that of ongoing fragmentation, dispossession, segregation, and subjugation, uh, an experience of settler colonialism, uh, basically. Uh, let me explain just a little bit. Fragmentation meaning basically, you know, fragmenting uh, the Palestinian society into different areas, ruling them in different ways. Palestinian refugees outside not being allowed to return, Palestinians who remained in what is now called 48, being basically subject to discriminatory laws, second and third class citizens, Palestinians in what is called the occupied Palestinian territories, the West Bank Gaza, including East Jerusalem, basically being subjugated in Gaza to an illegal blockade and collective punishment in Gaza, in, in the West Bank to military rule, and in, West, in East Jerusalem, basically a mix of, of, of all of that, as, as we could see in, in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, but this is, seems also only kind of a means to an end. Um, uh, the logic of settler colonialism, also as Asil was describing, is basically a logic of erasure and re replacement. Uh, so indeed, our story is a story of being victim uh, to this. But that is not the whole story. Um, another equally important part of the story is the ongoing and active resistance to it, to this regime. Um, so not just resilience, I mean, there is great value and it is part of the resistance that we're able to maintain our presence and existence uh, under this severely oppressive reality. Uh, it, it itself is important, but there is also the component of being proactive, having this proactive agency of fighting against this system. So let me just give basically a temporal and geographic uh, scope to what I'm about to say, right? This year, we celebrate 73 years of Nakba, um, the experience of 48 in, in particular. Yes, we call it ongoing, and, uh, and, and we've been describing it as that. But there's that historic event that we commemorate every year on the 15th of May. But it's also this year, uh, we can also celebrate 10 years anniversary of when Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and in Syria uh, attempted to return. Uh, to Palestine had marched in their hundreds towards the border of historic Palestine, what is now Israel, uh, to try to basically return to their homes. Tens of people were killed and many more were injured, of course. But since then, if we take, you know, these 10 years as this basically my temporal scope, uh, and the geographic here, meaning, you know, it goes beyond uh, historic Palestine, it's these refugees who are coming also from Lebanon and from Syria, who have attempted to return. This, this is the geography of the Palestinian experience currently, right? And in temporarily, in, 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 temporarily in, in, in the 10 years, uh, uh, there have been many experiences. I mean, I'm just limiting, limiting it to these 10 years. It goes well beyond, but this is just to give an, a, a taste and an example of what we have right now, right? And what we're able to build on. Um, there's been many people organizing and taking action against the systematic oppression imposed by Israel. So let me let me just mention a few. Uh, yes, the great march, you know, the march of return of the Palestinian refugees from Lebanon and Syria in 2018. We've also seen the great march of return, where uh, Palestinians in Gaza, majority of whom are refugees, uh, been forcibly displaced from their homes in what is now Israel, have also attempted to return to their homes and march week after week being killed also in their hundreds, you know, to try to return under the banner of return, returning to our homes that we were displaced from in 1948. There was also another banner of, of, of lifting the blockade and, 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 and the collective punishment there. Um, since then also, I mean, in these 10 years, we've seen the, the rise and fall uh, of popular resistance committees. Um, 
Palestinian or, or, you know, organizing in villages that have been affected by either illegal settlements or uh, the uh, separation and segregation wall, uh, fighting actively against that. Uh, and I say up and down because it is has been for them a brutal experience. Like if you look at the village of Nabi Saleh in 2009, they launched their weekly protests. Um, it went on week after week, uh, facing the brutal violence of the Israeli forces, uh, a use of weapons uh, to injure and kill, uh, night raids, uh, arrest of children in the middle of the night, blockading the village, uh, harassing uh, people coming in and out of it preventing people from reaching a water spring and etc. A whole host of really oppressive measures that change all the time. Uh, there was a height of these protests and now it's calming down, um, but it's not to say that it's ended. There are people regroup and people try to organize to go ahead again. The Al-Aqsa electronic gates, uh, a, a, a couple of years ago when Israel tried to impose Electronic gates on the gate, electronic devices on the gates to Al Aqsa, uh, and try to also install uh, cameras. There was uh, an upheaval against that. People organized, started playing in the streets. You know, religious and non-religious people, Muslims and Christians, uh, organized against that, and eventually managed to uh, deny Israel the imposition of those. And you know, tens of groups uh, organizing, collectives getting together, uh, cooperatives uh, springing up. You know, very inspiringly, uh, across the West Bank, there are these agricultural uh, cooperatives that sprung up by youth groups, um, initiatives. Uh, you know, uh, that ha that happen sometimes within a political context, sometimes within a social context, but they do happen and they continue. So, um, <clears throat> and. Uh, not to miss, and go back to your question, Nadine, most recently, uh, the strike of dignity and the mass mobilization that we're still experiencing until now. Uh, the strike of dignity just happened yesterday, where perhaps for the first time since 1939 uh, or the 1930s, uh, a Palestinian strike across historic Palestine. Uh, this strike has been uh, really tremendous, uh, very inspiring. Uh, the way that people committed to it and how they were mobilizing in the day uh, of the strike, uh, holding cultural events, events for kids, but also uh, uh, marching in demonstration, in protest, uh, to where uh, you have uh, military checkpoints and any kind of friction with, with the Israeli occupying forces. Um, so I could say that we may have defeated Fragmentation, or we are basically defeating uh, fragmentation. Fragmentation did not work. We are all here in Palestine and outside taking action and asserting our collective identity as Palestinians. So there is a defeat of one of these components uh, of the regime that we're under. So, and I believe this is the foundation, you know, this is the crucial foundation for then organizing better and taking more strategic action against the other components of this regime, uh, the components of segregation, separation, subjugation, uh, to end the dispossession and, 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 and be able to uh, uh, really see, see uh, the end of the tunnel here when it comes to the settler colonial regime. Thank you, Saleh, for uh, drawing we're painting for us this, this this broad trajectory, historical trajectory of, of what Palestinian resistance looks like and has looked like and how it's all in fact uh, interconnected. Uh, oppression might be the name of the, of the game uh, on, on the ground, so to speak, but what we're seeing and have been seeing in fact for, for decades uh, and since, since the British mandate is, is a mobilization amongst the Palestinian people that uh, that that should not go unnoticed, and that in fact does merit uh, its own place uh, and recognition. <clears throat> excuse me, recognition uh, in, within the history of Palestinian resistance. Um, uh, speaking of 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 sort of these these regimes of power that have come to sort of uh, dominate the way we speak about resistance or displacement or or dispossession or segregation or fragmentation, as you as you described, uh, uh, Saleh. Asil, I'd like to ask you a bit about uh, some some work, some of the the reports and the studies that Al Haq has been has been producing and is planning to produce 
uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, first of all, if uh, we, we missed the last, very last few words of your of your previous answer, uh, if you'd like to to follow through or to to finish off what you had to say, uh, and then I'll uh, I'll just pose the the next question for you. Uh, so Al Haq has been produce is working on producing a new report about apartheid and settler colonialism. Can you tell us about these findings of the Al Haq team? both in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of these frameworks uh, as they relate to Palestinians and the struggle for liberation and, uh, uh, and, and whether or not that there are other avenues that we should be exploring in terms of, uh, of, of the, the, the lexicon, the word, the language, the discourses and uh, sort of different regimes of, of power that, uh, uh, that we should be uh, uh, accessing. Uh, yeah, I think for the last uh, couple of words I was saying were part of uh, a hope that I was trying to say because I was trying, to, uh, I was talking about the the violence and displacement, dispossession uh, of the Israeli regime. But I think uh, Saleh captured the the hope and the resistance of the Palestinian uh, historically, but also. Uh, at the moment, uh, so I will skip on that. But um, answering question on the uh, apartheid report, the forthcoming apartheid framework, uh, uh, apartheid uh, report of Al-Haq, I would like just to say that this is a report that is building on decades of work from Palestinian civil study on the legal apartheid framework. Uh, but this uh, forthcoming will be more comprehensive and uh, for the findings, we, uh, we've been uh, analyzing Israel's apartheid regime since 1948 and how it captures all the Palestinians, it's a regime enforced against all the Palestinian people, including Palestinian refugees uh, and, and in exile and Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territory. So this is the, the, the uh, framework uh, and what it captures. So uh, in terms of strength, it, it, it dismantles the fragmentation of the Palestinian people uh, we see in other frameworks, such as the uh, occupation framework, which only focuses on Palestinians in the occupied uh, Palestinian territory. So this is a framework that captures all the Palestinian people. And in terms of how we analyze this within the, the legal uh, framework, uh, we first talk about Israel's discriminatory laws, which lays the foundation of uh, of its apartheid regime. So we're talking, for example, about uh, the laws that denies Palestinian refugees their, their, their right to return, but also the laws that uh, dispossess their properties. Uh, we're talking about laws that allows exclusively Israeli Jews to enter Israel and be granted Israeli uh, Jewish uh, citizenship upon arrival. Uh, and we contrast these laws to show how these uh, uh, laws that were issued in the immediate aftermath of the establishment of the settler colonial state of Israel were established to ensure uh, a maintenance of this regime. Uh, and then we talk about the other policy, which is one of the main uh, policies, primary tools Israel uses to maintain its apartheid regime, which is the fragmentation. And we, uh, Salah also captured this. Uh, we're, we're seeing this geographically as we talk about Palestinians, uh, whereby Palestinians in, in occupied Palestinian territory, even in, in West Bank and in Jerusalem and in Gaza, are treated differently. Rather, uh, and also Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinian refugees and in exiles, and how all these uh, categories. Um, are treated differently by the Palestinian, by, by Israeli uh, uh, settler colonial apartheid regime, but they, they fall within the same regime. And this is what we're seeing today with the violence against all these categories and also the Palestinian resistance and response to one regime. Uh, we, we, for example, in the policy of maintenance uh, of the fragmentation, one of the main tools Israel fragments Palestinians is the denial of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes. Uh, almost half of the Palestinian people are refugees, and they are still denied the right to return, as we today commemorate uh, the this month commemorates the 73rd anniversary of the Nakba. Uh, another policies which we see is also because Israel is logically, uh, because we also need to understand that apartheid is a symptom 
of a uh, settler colonialism and typically a settler colonial state is racist so uh in order for israel to maintain its apartheid regime it, it conducts or creates a coercive environment where the palestinians are forced the palestinian people are forced to leave their homes with various means we are seeing for example widespread house demolitions uh, across the the west bank we're seeing the the example of sheikh jarrah uh, of forced eviction policies is also just one another example, the policy of residency revocation and all these policies that they try to manipulate the demographic composition of Palestine in order to drive Palestinian uh, to uh, to trans uh, forcibly transfer from their homes. Uh, but the and the last point, uh, because an element, uh, the third element of the apartheid regime uh, crime, sorry, is the intention uh, to maintain an apartheid regime. And for, uh, I think it's very easy to see Israel's intention to, to maintain uh, its apartheid regime. And it, it does that by suppressing uh, Palestinian resistance and opposition. And this is very evident today as we speak. We're seeing Palestinians protesting and striking. As uh, Saleh said, the, the general strike two days ago was also very uh, historic in terms of how it captured all the Palestinian people uh, we've seen this the last time in 1963, we were seeing this in 2021. So the suppression of Palestinian people in terms of the use of force, the killing in protest, in terms of the administrative detention and, and um, arbitrary detention it conducts against Palestinian across historic Palestine, the torture in these detention centers, the this, even the censor of Palestinian content, content on social media as the word is spreading across the world on, on the injustice inflicted on the Palestinian people is being censored. So all these uh, methods Israel uses to suppress our voice and our resistance proves uh, the intention of how it wants to, to maintain its, its apartheid regime. Now, this is the overall framework of how we uh, analyze the uh, fra uh, apartheid framework in our report. And as I said, it helps uh, in terms of strength. It helps in, in uh, frag uh, dismantling the fragmentation that has been imposed on the Palestinian people geographically, but also in terms of narrative, because we've seen uh, the Palestinian struggle being uh, portrayed as a conflict uh, specific to the West, uh, to occupied Palestinian territory, and therefore talking about conflict resolution uh, issues and uh, peace uh, peace attempts and so on and so forth, which is very, uh, which does not fit into a colonial uh, struggle. Um, so this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, strengths of the apartheid and settler colonial uh, frameworks. But we also need to understand that l international law and the apartheid framework uh, uh, in specific are just tools towards Palestinian uh, liberation because in order for the Palestinian people to have the right to return insured and to have the right, uh, right self-determination insured and to arrive at a future where decolonization and liber liberation is fulfilled, there needs to be a political strategy to, with, what, with, the, with the law as a tool towards all these, uh, uh, all these uh, future we, we, we um, we uh, we see for the Palestinian people, uh, and unfortunately, as the Palestinian political leadership is um, uh, is not focusing on uh, in its struggle towards um, liberation and decolonization as it has done so in the 60s and 70s, uh, it is the role of individuals and civil society groups and. Uh, uh, solidarity groups ac across the globe to, to use law, but also other tools uh, within a political project and vision towards uh, liberation and decolonization in Palestine. Thank you, Asil, uh, for the very thorough explanation of just how these frameworks are, are sort of work as, as one, but also separately, and also how uh, what, what these limits look like. I want to uh, ask, go, go to Saleh for the final question before the Q&A, uh, to go more, more deeply into these limitations uh, of not just apartheid and settler colonial, colonialism as frameworks for explaining uh, uh, resistance and explaining anti-colonial mobilization, but also international law. Uh, and, and, and its limits, certainly vis-a-vis -vis the, the, uh, the liberation, Palestinian struggle for liberation. 
So, Saleh, through your work with Amnesty, you've been engaged in the international legal scene. Can you describe to us the current international legal climate when it comes to Palestine and holding Israel accountable under international law? Uh, what are the limitations of this framework? Certainly, we know that Israel continues to, to, to not abide by international law. And uh, what would you believe is needed to move Palestinian freedom forward? To start with what I would end with, uh, to your question, uh, what we need is just exactly what Asil uh, just described, uh, which is basically, you know, strategy and, and mobilization when it comes uh, to Palestinians uh, on the ground in Palestine and elsewhere. Uh, but let me come to that also again um, at the end. Uh, look, there are two things. I mean, when it comes to, for example, organizations like Amnesty International, where I work, uh, uh, opportunities uh, such as that the one at the ICC currently, which to describe to viewers and, and audience, uh, the International Criminal Court, part of the international order, has finally, after years of deliberation, uh, opened an investigation into the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories. So basically, um, an investigation into the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza, starting from June 2014 and encompassing uh, any and all, basically, violations under international law in the Rome Statute, which is, you know, the legal, basically, the legal foundations of the court, um, and until today. Uh, this is, follows Palestine, a uh, state which was uh, then recognized um, uh, as a non-member state in the, in the United Nations joining uh, uh, as, a, as a member state in, in the ICC. Um, there was a preliminary examination. Uh, that then led to a uh, recommendation to open an investigation. Uh, a pre-trial chamber of uh, three judges looked at the question of whether the court has jurisdiction over the OPT, finally decided that it does, and an investigation was launched. So this is indeed an opportunity. It's a, it's a brilliant opportunity. Um, from a perspective of international human rights organizations, uh, this is you know, a major, huge part uh, of a strategy trying to uh, ensure better respect and protection for human rights. Right? Another opportunity we can just mention because it's also very recent is with the UN Human Rights Council establishing uh, the list of uh, companies uh, doing business in or with illegal Israeli settlements. And I think this is also from a perspective of a human rights organization, a, a tremendous uh, achievement that Mainly, really, local organizations like Al Haq uh, have, have have led to, to in order to establish. Now, for for Amnesty, huge part. For Palestinians, this needs to be one part, but not a huge or a central part to a strategy. Right? It it needs to be uh, understood uh, very critically, uh, like the rest of the situation, for us to be able to move forward and to defeat this. Uh, 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 really powerful, you know, oppressive mechanism that fights uh, uh, against us on a daily basis, we need to have a critical understanding of the situation of both, you know, opportunities, but also challenges. Uh, when it comes to uh, the International Criminal Court and the international mechanisms like also the UN, we need to really understand them as being part of uh, the Western global order, right? The global order, the same global order that helped and facilitated and still supports Settler colonialism in Palestine. So, this means, you know, taking advantage of an opportunity uh, at the ICC needs needs to be within basically a much larger strategy uh, of political mobilization and organization towards an end goal, you know, which is liberation from the settler colonial uh, uh, reality and regime in which we are under. So, uh, the way then this the way they're looking at it from a Palestinian perspective, one, you know, it is a way to expose uh, the reality under which Palestinians live, um, the crimes uh, that are committed on daily basis, and or, you know, expose the international order uh, itself. You know, I am inspired, and this is not me, just to say, uh, you know, I'm inspired by Noura Arikat, um, her book, and uh, Justice for Some, and also a recent article um, a, a, under the title "We Charge Apartheid," which I recommend everybody really to look to to, to read, uh, um, which which is basically inspiring what I'm saying right now. Um, so to go back and also to to the point that 
uh, uh, Yasir was making. You know, at the end of the day, it is needing to have uh, the strategy, needing to accumulate and build on what the youth, you know, as she was describing, have been able to achieve over the past years. You know, in my first, <clears throat> in my first intervention, I was talking about the last 10 years since the March of Return uh, from Lebanon and Syria and capturing, you know, what has happened since then. You know, we need to learn from these experiences. We need to build on these experiences and be able to organize and mobilize better. It is the youth at the forefront. Uh, and let me just here say, I mean, the, the oldest of the people who are now taking action and mobilizing uh, uh, are basically the generation of the first intifada. Uh, you go then and, you know, you reach the failed negotiations and then uh, the 2005 call for BDS, uh, the 2006 infighting in Gaza between Fatah and Hamas, the 2007 uh, imposition of the blockade on Gaza, the wars of 2008, 2012, and, and 2014, and now again, 2021. And now, you know, the reality we were describing as basically trying, you know, defeating the fragmentation, coming together, the strike, the mobilization that is happening from the north until the, and, and, uh, all the way to the, to the south uh, uh, in, in the Naqab. Uh, so what is needed is to recognize all these opportunities and challenges in a very critical manner, try to take advantage of them, but essentially what is needed is a strategy that is built on education, uh, educating ourselves, uh, educating others, organizing and mobilizing uh, against the settler colonial reality. Thank you, Saleh. And as, a, as an educator myself, I really appreciate the, the last the sort of uh, the, the, the emphasis on education as, as a means to, of moving forward. I agree completely. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the 30 minutes we had initially planned for, but uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is what it means to report and analyze on things that are, uh, that, are, that are occurring in real time and so ongoing. There's much to say, there's much to analyze. Um, I'm going to try my best to synthesize as many of these questions as possible. We've received a few. I encourage the audience to continue to submit their questions. Um, <clears throat> I will start with uh, a question uh, for a team. Um, can since uh, you mentioned the general strike that uh, that took place yesterday, can you can you tell us more about what the position of the PA uh, has been regarding these protests and the general strike, and in fact regarding the larger uh, uh, protests and and, uh, and uprisings that we are witnessing uh, across across historic Palestine and the West Bank, more specifically. Yeah, I think uh, the general strike and more generally the protests that is uh, that are going on across Palestine are uh, people driven. Uh, they're not politicized. They're not a political. Uh, they're not um, affiliated towards any political party. And this, uh, I believe, gives them uh, their strength because it's the voice of the people. Uh, and it's the demands of the people that I've highlighted previously, which is uh, to dismantle the fragmentation of the Palestinian people and to represent the Palestinian people as a whole. Uh, so uh, the, the general strike is as well has been used in the Palestinian struggle, uh, as Saleh highlighted in uh, even before the establishment of the State of Israel uh, during the British uh, mandate time in 1936. Uh, and Palestinians uh, struck for th uh, six months uh, towards uh, ending the uh, Zionist, uh, because uh, Britain was facilitating the Zionist settler colonial presence uh, at the time in Palestine. So this is a tool, the strike and the protests are a tool uh, that the Palestinian people have used because they, first of all, they're facing a, uh, a power that is, uh, above uh, that is very, uh, there's an asymmetrical power. Uh, uh, and also this power has been since 1948 uh, facilitated and supported by the international community, uh, unfortunately, uh, starting from allowing the partition of Palestine and then moving on towards uh, allowing Israel as a member state at the United Nations 
And then with the failure of the international community to hold Israel accountable or to sanction Israel so that it, it ends uh, committing its crime with, with infinite, infinite uh, uh, impunity. Uh, so yes, uh, I would say general strike is, is a tool of the Palestinian people not represented, not uh, being supported, uh, not supported, but like not being, um, uh, not a PA uh, tool, but a, a, a tool of the people themselves. Absolutely, and I think what, what the strike yesterday really signified is just the, truly how obsolete Palestinian political uh, bodies have become in terms of the, 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 the struggle. Uh, in fact, just this, this leads into the next question for Saleh, which, which is about leadership. Uh, given your, your, your analysis of, of the ongoing situation, uh, certainly of, of the protests around historic Palestine and, and within 1948 uh, lands, uh, what is your take on uh, leadership uh, within this, this, this revolution, this uprising? What does it look like? Where is it? Uh, are there leaders uh, and so on? Uh, if, that makes, if that makes sense, I think that was a very compelling question from one of our audience members. Yeah, there is an absence of you know leadership in the classical sense of the word, where uh, you have a group of basically, you know, organizing and and and, and leading a struggle here. Um, uh, that's ha that has been the case. I mean, for for decades, uh, possibly you know after the death of Yasser Arafat. And if we are to measure, you know, look at basically the human rights record of uh, the the current uh, uh, leadership, uh, you know, quote unquote here sitting in Ramallah or even the one in, in Gaza. Uh, you know, it, it, this is not a leadership that is working in the interest of the people. I mean, there are patterns of violations that we see repeated year after year after year, uh, including, you know, uh, violations of freedom of expression, uh, association, preventing people from mobilizing on the ground, uh, uh, protesting. Uh, you know, I myself have been covering, for example, you know, I've mentioned this temporal scope of, you know, the Palestinian Spring from 2011 until now. 2011, you know, uh, I was on the street monitoring when Palestinians first sprung into action against in solidarity with the Tunisian revolution and the Egyptian revolution. And, you know, the Palestinian authorities were basically again, acting against people beaten up, people detained, just were acting in solidarity, you know, let alone actually taking action against uh, their own leadership. But then that developed, you know, and there was a movement against the political split of Hamas and Fatah, and that it's, it was also repressed. And you go on and on, you know, we have a huge problem when it comes to arbitrary detention and, and torture. Like, for example, we condemn uh, the administrative detention that Israel, you know, uses uh, um, uh, as a pattern against Palestinians with hundreds, you know, sometimes reaching thousands at, at points of, for example, the intifadas being put um, in prison uh, without charge or trial for indefinite periods of time. This is also a practice that is used by the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank right now where you know you could be uh, a detained without charge and trial on order by a governor and uh, you know kept basically for indefinite periods of time this is reflective of then the leadership that you have here um, uh, let, let alone i mean also uh, other issues uh, that have to do with for example women's rights uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, issues you know the uh, 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 corruption uh, massive corruption uh, problems of corruption that we have uh, in 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 the West Bank, you know, and very visible here, for example, in Ramallah where I'm speaking. So uh, all of this is reflective of basically not a leadership, but a group that is driven by uh, self-interest and and basically trying to take advantage of the situation, basically to ensure that these interests remain in place. Uh, I think this is coming to an end. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the experience of the last weeks uh, has really shaken up that foundation on which the stability of this leadership is able to kind of depend on. And, uh, you know, if, if I was them looking at everything that is happening outside, I would be extremely worried. Thank you, Saleh, for, for that explanation. Uh, I'd like, just in the interest of time, to continue to ask the questions, but uh, I... Uh, Thank you so much for your analysis. Um, Asil, a, a question for you. This, this is perhaps a bit theoretical, but also could be, could be material and tangible in terms of, in terms of uh, your, your own analysis and your interest in, in exploring decolonization. Can you describe to us what that looks like? 
right, for Palestinians. Is that is it? So our our, our, our audience members saying, aside from the end of military occupation, what does decolonization mean for Palestinians? I see that it looks like we have uh, maybe lost you again. Uh, if you don't, oh, there we go. We'll, we'll wait for her to reconnect, but let's go to the next question, Saleh. Um, uh, an interesting question that I think uh, you would you would uh, be best fit to answer given given your research and your work. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion about uh, Palestinians across Palestine, whether they're in the West Bank or, the, or Gaza or 1948, uh, and how these voices are sort of, as you, as you rightfully said, fragmented and segregated and so on. Are there any groups, or organizations, or efforts that are working across these so-called borders? Uh, and certainly these days uh, during, during what we're seeing. Look, I think every initiative, at least I've come across, uh, emphasizes uh, the collective identity that crosses uh, the Green Line and then crosses basically historic Palestine to reach refugees and uh, Palestinians in the diaspora. Uh, there's been a reaffirmation of this. Like, for example, if you see, uh, I believe I, I, I saw a picture yesterday that I, I just loved. Uh, I'm not sure from which protest, but uh, a woman was holding a car, that, a, a placard that was saying, until uh, a, a, the child from the Jalil uh, is playing with his friend from Gaza in the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I, I think this, this describes kind of the, the sense of, of now, how we're seeing ourselves, that we are there, we're here, we're in Jalil, we're in Gaza, we're elsewhere, and we want to be basically wherever we want to be in historic Palestine, because this is ours, because this is, uh, you know, our families and our home. And, um, and, and you see that basically reflected. I think, you know, the placards is one and, and, and the protests uh, either in Haifa, Ramallah or Jerusalem are emphasizing that, groups are emphasizing that, you know, I am uh, part of a group called Jil al-Tajdeed al-Demokrati, which kind of sprung up um, in, in the kind of atmosphere of elections, which, you know, were announced and then taken away, basically to promote uh, more of political participation in the form of kind of uh, political representation and how Palestinians can mobilize. And, you know, from the onset, there was a, an affirmation that uh, Palestinians are one uh, in Palestine, across the Green Line and outside in the refugee camps and in the diaspora. Um, the, you know, the experiences I've also mentioned in the, my previous interventions, I mean, many of them are also uh, speaking about the collective identity. And you also hear it a lot from the outside as well, right? I mean, when you hear the discourse coming from the diaspora, it is uh, about this. It is about where they're from, uh, but also about Palestine being undivided. Um, you know, also uh, uh, the, maybe the campaigns and initiatives that are now thinking about and formulating ideas about the one state, you know, that basically we should move beyond uh, any kind of premise of dividing Palestine, of this, you know, partition that has happened that was basically the foundation of how the international community is trying to impose then a political solution on us and say, no, that's not how it works. This premise is flawed. Uh, Palestine will, should not be partitioned and any solution based on partition will only lead to what we're seeing right now, just more of the oppression and more of the violations. The premise needs to be that Palestine is not divided and that people in it are free to be and move and and create families as and, and initiatives and take actions as they like. And so, and I think this you, you see this more and more and more, and I believe it will be better formulated into more kind of political programs and political action as as uh, as we go along. Thank you, Saleh. Uh, perhaps that's what decolonization means: uh, the, the end to division and fragmentation. Um, but uh, I see welcome back, and um, I'm sorry that that you were disconnected. Uh, but please, the question is yours. We uh, we asked Saleh another question, uh, but we go back to you uh, and tell us about decolonization. Yeah, I'm so sorry, my internet connection was bad. But um, yeah, for I think the decolonization is so big, but 
but I also think that whenever we're thinking about the Palestinian future as the Palestinian people, we think about the form of what Palestine is, but we don't focus a lot about the, the content of this uh, reality or the future. And I think this is what we should focus on because it's not our job to focus on the form of our future. Uh, it's it's the job of the, the settler colonial state that has been uh, existing in our lives for a uh, hundred years now. Uh, and uh, when I when I see 2021, I see us with the first step of this decolonized future because uh, I think this is a, a, a one of the first time that we're also reclaiming the, the narrative and acknowledging that Israel is a settler colonial state and Israel is an apartheid state and where we're, uh, the world is acknowledging the historical and ongoing uh, reality of, of Israel regime in Palestine since 48. Uh, so this is the first step which we need to build on and which we need to uh, mobilize even more and more. Uh, we need to stop uh, the discourse that uh, portrays uh, Palestine as uh, as the occupied as occupation in the occupied Palestinian territory and towards ending the military occupation in this in this part of Palestine. So now we're we're at this stage where we're 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 discussing and we're seeing discourse in the in the, the in the Congress talking about ethnic cleansing and the right of return of refugees and this is unprecedented. So we need to build on this. Uh, and uh, Saleh also touched on criminal justice, which is one part of justice that we also, as Palestinian people, uh, have been pursuing. But prosecute, prosecuting a few individuals uh, for uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity, including the apartheid crime, is also not enough. It it absolutely is important to end or to contribute to, to putting an end Israel's uh, impunity and holding uh, some. Um, Israeli perpetrators accountable, but it's also not enough because we need more than that. We need reparations. We need the Palestinian right to return to be uh, fulfilled. We need uh, to return to our original homes. We need the, the logic of the Zionist settler colonial regime to, de to be dismantled because if this logic continues, it will still uh, remain to look at the Palestinian right to return as a threat to its existence, not as a right. Uh, and this logic drives all the ongoing policies, be it the displacement in Sheikh Jarrah or the house demolition in, in, in the West Bank and Jerusalem or the displacement in the Naqab. So this logic is the, the, the logic that drives the, the ongoing displacement and disposition. This is what needs to be dismantled in terms of policies and laws. Uh, all these needs to be dismantled as well. We don't need legal reform. We need the dismantle of all these laws that drive our uh, the injustice inflicted on the Palestinian people, uh, uh, and we need to be uh, voicing our our rights as Palestinians and protesting and ho holding our Palestinian flag without being killed. Uh, this is decolonization in Palestine. Thank you so much, Asid. Um, a, a final question that received the most number of votes, yet it was perhaps the shortest question on the list. I'd like to ask this of both of you, and just given time, our, uh, uh, we have a minute left, but we'll certainly go over uh, but by a few minutes, so not to worry. But if you would uh, both speak to this, and the question is, uh, what can we do to support the Palestinians from abroad? BDS, uh, that's one, uh, you know, very direct. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's quite simple, um, you know, uh, be conscious of, um, you know, your consumer behavior, uh, look at what you're buying, look what you're putting your money into. Um, and, and then, you know, it, it, the way, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll be very short and move it to you, Asil. Uh, sorry, I kind of jumped in immediately like this. So. Um, you know, and and uh, you know, uh, be educate. You know, educate yourself and others about how uh, uh, speak about uh, the situation here. This is not a conflict. It is not a clash. Uh, this is uh, you know an apartheid settler colonial regime, 
and it needs to be dismantled. You know, this is the only framing, and we need this as Palestinians. We, and we're seeing this happen, as Asil was pointing, about, you know, members of the Congress recognizing the situation as it is. This is great, unprecedented. We should build on this. Um, yeah, not to repeat what you're saying, but I do agree with everything. And I, I think just to emphasize this, um, I think now uh, the world is hearing more from Palestinians and we need to continue to hear from Palestinians. Uh, uh, we need uh, to, um, uh, in terms of uh, actions and countermeasures, we didn't talk about this uh, comprehensively, but I think it is now the time to take actions in terms of sanctioning Israel. We need to pressure our governments. There is solidarity group, groups, uh, Palestinian solidarity groups across the globe that are working uh, on uh, towards uh, 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 liberation in Palestine. And you can uh, connect with these groups uh, and push your government to uh, to sanction Israel for its crime because this is sanction sanctioning Israel is not is not a favor uh, to ask from from international community and states it's it's their legal obligation under international law because we're talking about grave crimes such as the apartheid crime so this is a legal obligation sanctions include the economic and diplomatic sanctions. The, at the moment when you when you're watching the news about the bombing in Gaza uh, we need to push our governments to to end the the arms and uh, arms uh, deals with with Israel both ways uh, we need to to as uh, Saleh said boycott uh, Israeli products and also there's been some initiatives in the world such as in Ireland to ban the products uh, from illegal settlements uh, this has to be done all over the world uh, this is not something to issue because, as I said, this is a legal obligation. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to add to our audience members, continue your effort, your effortful work on social media, all the platforms. This, this revolution is spreading and uh, it's so moving every day to see folks from all over the world. Uh, for us here in the Middle East, it's really heartwarming to see that this kind of solidarity and and camaraderie so thank you uh, and please continue to post and repost and share and, and, and tweet and, and all those things um really sad to say that we've run out of time so uh first and foremost i'd like to thank our guests and thank you for bringing to our attention such important realities about the ongoing Nakhde that we and that palestinians are living across historic palestine and throughout the world uh, you've given us much to think about as we continue to watch uh, and read about Palestinians fighting for their lives and for their freedom. Uh, while what we're seeing might be uh, ongoing in many ways and a continuation in the great scheme of Palestinian history of our Nakba, it's also unprecedented in scope and quality. Uh, the spontaneous resistance Palestinians and especially youth have exhibited over the last few weeks signals a critical shift in the struggle for liberation a shift from reliance on, on corrupt uh, uh, and obsolete state and legal actors and bodies to the people themselves. Uh, we're also witnessing a critical shift in the global solidarity movement, uh, a movement in which social media has acquired new valence in promoting awareness of Israel's violence and of Palestinians' fight for freedom. So as we go back to our screens tonight and in the days ahead, I hope we carry these, these realizations with us uh, and that they uh, inspire some, some hope uh, and pride in, in, in us and in the Palestinian people. Uh, I'd also like to thank you, our audience all over the world, for joining us this evening and for submitting your engaging thoughts and questions. Uh, before we sign off, uh, I'd just like to remind everyone that Policy Labs are a crowdfunded program of Al Shabaka, so we do rely on your uh, continued support. Uh, if you're able to donate, please do so by clicking on the donate link that should now appear on your screens. Uh, thank you all again so much, and thank you to our speakers, and uh, good night from Amna. Um, uh